Right, so we started this work in 2017, and there were about, it's a qualitative study, about, two, we spent 2.53 hours per interview, and we interviewed only women who wanted to go to work, right, who, were, who had gone to Doctors of Tomorrow, usually because they were referred by their social worker, and uh, were now ready to get into work and really wanted to find work. Um, so, we, and we paid them $30 for the time that they spent with us. We also spoke to social workers and child care operators as part of our research to understand the system better. Next slide, please. And all of these women, they needed income, to try to meet their basic needs. We came across other families who really scrimmed on their meals. Uh, eggs and ketchup, Maggie Me were sometimes all that they, they could afford. They, really, they felt very sad often that they couldn't give their kids what they wanted. Many had debts, they would have to negotiate with HDB or not pay the full utilities bill. And they felt often quite sad about their situation, low self-esteem, and this is where Doctors of Tomorrow came in with the confidence curriculum, right? To give them a little bit of uh, encouragement and then to help them to actually find their way to work. Next slide, please. So, uh, we asked ourselves, like, you know, why was it so difficult then with the motivation of these women who had every reason to want to go to work and with the tremendous support that Daughters of Tomorrow was providing, why was it still so difficult to find work and to stay in work and to have good quality work, right? So that is what the research is about. Next slide, please. Who, who are these women that we interviewed? Average age, 37 to 40 years old, that was the age range. Number of children, uh, we only interviewed mothers, so everyone had at least one kid. Uh, some had as, as many as seven kids, but the average was two kids. Household income, 1,500 to 1,999, which means that this is the bottom 10% of income in Singapore, right? Bottom 10% percentile. And... Many of them had checkered histories. They started work. Now, many of these are second generation poor. That means that their parents were poor. They had up to O level education. Some had less. And they started work at 16, 17. Many were on social assistance. And mostly they were married. There were a handful of single mothers and some divorced parents, but mostly they were married. Next slide, please. So we looked at the first issue, right? What was it that prevented them, made it so difficult for them to get work? Uh, this is why we looked at mothers, because we knew that there's a gender dimension to this. It's the family support that they need to take care of the family members. So for these families, almost 100%, it was the mothers that were actually doing the caregiving. Um, many of the fathers were working shift work and you know also trying their best. And they didn't have, right? If you can imagine uh, those of you who are parents in this room or know what it is like to be parents, if you, if I asked you to do a full day paid job as well as take care of two kids and you didn't have a foreign domestic worker to help you, any family support, um, it would be very, very difficult to manage even if there was childcare, right? And many of these uh, women did not have the parents or the parents-in-law to actually help. Why? Because they are second generation poor. Their families are also very stressed. They had some, in many cases, there were very strained relationships with their parents, parents-in-law. Um, there's also a, a high um, degree of uh, 
bad health uh, to related to the poverty issues as well. So they have to depend on public support, and that means subsidized childcare, right? And what we found was, and we, we then examined this very closely, long waiting lists, a high compliance cost, um, low quality of childcare and mismatch hours. I'll go through each of these. Next slide. So do we have enough childcare in Singapore, right? If we look at the total number of childcare places, yes, we have enough childcare. If you take public and private, there's enough childcare. But if we just look at subsidized, which is what we call the AOP and the POP, anchor operated or partner operated childcares, there are insufficient spots uh, in certain areas, leading to um, in long waiting lists when the families wanted to apply for childcare. The government has said, by 2022, we will have another 40,000 more childcare places. This means that currently it's probably, you know, the, the fact that they need to, to have so many more and are striving for so much more means the shortage now is, uh, is known and is, uh, is significant. So we tried to find out exactly what this deficit is, but there is, it was difficult, right? So the next slide is that, was that of what we call high compliance. So how much exactly does childcare cost? Is it a question of it being too expensive? Many of you probably have heard of the $5 childcare. Um, but, uh, so we, we had to dig a little bit in order to understand this. So interestingly, you know, when I was speaking to Siti just before, I found that she was working for a childcare center. And her childcare center costs $2,000 per child, right? We, so there are childcare centers. These are the private ones, which are so super expensive, right? And Siti's job there is actually somewhere in this path, okay? So this was a connection I made earlier. So, we don't take the $2,000 childcare, we take the subsidized childcare, which are the AOP, POPs, you know, the NTUC type childcare, which starts at $700 average monthly fee. Still a lot, right? For a family where the income level is at about one five. Um, so that's not affordable, okay? But there are subsidies. So, you know, and it's complex, and that's why we show this road, it's complex because it depends how much you pay and whether you can end up paying $5 for your child in childcare. Depends on many factors and there are many gatekeepers along the way. Okay. As with one of the things that the Singapore government is inclined to do is this case by case basis, right? Um, so you will get Everyone will get, can get a $150 subsidy, that's not a problem. If you want to get more, you should be working, need to be working at least 56 hours a month. So that's first barrier. 56 hours a month may not sound like a lot, but if you are a casual worker waiting to be called, you know, like the, someone says, okay, uh, we need more help on Wednesday evening, can you come? that 56 hours is not really so much within your control. So there is that. And of course, if you have two kids, three kids, you can't actually be in stable, and it'll be hard for you to be in stable employment if you don't have all of the family support. So 56 hours is one barrier. If you're not able to meet the 60, 56 hours, then you have to get your social worker to help. You go to FSC, so the first person you need to go to would be uh, FSC. Right, to get some help to say, can you please write a letter to say that, you know, this is why I can't do 56 hours and I need more support. And if you are really, uh, if there are family risk, you are looking for a job and uh, you are poor, they can actually do a special letter of recommendation. But you really do need a supportive, very supportive social worker. So, yeah, you can't get this uh, inexpensive childcare without going through MSF 
and uh, social worker. They, when we asked uh, ACTA, ACTA is Early Childhood uh, Development Agency, which is under the ministry, they said, oh, actually they don't need a social worker, they can go to, this, the childcare itself can do it. But many childcare operators don't do it because the paperwork is so horrendous. So I found out from City that actually her job is being part of this administrative thing. And many of these uh, childcare operators that actually were applying for subsidies, they needed one whole person to actually do this, right? And they didn't like it either. Now, it does nothing to stop people with, uh, who, can, uh, uh, who, who, can, who can't get public childcare and want to go to private childcare and apply for subsidies, but the, many of the private childcare operators, they don't want to do this work, right? This additional form filling and the justification, and it is not one time. It is every three months or six months that you have to keep applying for these subsidies. And they are pretty on the ball. They will actually act as pretty on the ball. They'll say, okay, this person, she got part-time appointment and uh, she, her job will end in three months' time. They actually do come back and say, so is she still working? Uh, or has, has her contract been renewed? So it's a constant administrative burden, right? Not a one-off. So yes, it is theoretically available, but in practice, it is quite challenging. Next slide, please. So, our recommendation for this, and you might have seen it in today's papers, we're saying, let's make life easier for everyone from the, low, from the families to the childcare operators. People that are earning below 2,500, just give them free childcare, okay? We said to government, this is a radical idea, we know, but you know, I think we really should be considering this. And um, I think there's some openness to this idea. But of course, we recognize that until 2022, we actually don't have enough childcare places in the subsidized childcare. So I don't think that it is fair that low income families do not have childcare because we did not build enough subsidized childcare. So we're saying until you have enough, you might also have to subsidize and make it free for people to go into private childcare, if so subsidize more, just so that no one is deprived of this. Childcare has been shown to be actually really good for the child's development. We don't want to have these families be third and fourth and fifth generation poor, right? If Singapore, and I think this is important for us, we have always thought of ourselves as a place where there is social mobility. So I think that this is um, something that we should ask for. Next slide. Quality of care. So, um, Siti shared her story about her son with eczema and coming home with blood under his fingernails. 20% of the people that we interviewed had similar complaints about their children not being fed properly or enough, diapers not being changed. There was some alleged abuse and they found that the place was not so hygienic. Okay, we're talking about subsidized childcare not the $2,000 childcare. And we have fed this back to ACTA, and they, they were very surprised and quite shocked, actually. Um, and we also shared with them that some of these women, because we asked them, did you then tell the childcare center that this is happening? And men, some of them said, no, we didn't, because we are only paying $5 childcare, so I don't think we have a right to complain. <laughs> but they took their child out of the childcare. So this doesn't actually get fed back to the authorities. So I think it's important that ACTA actually does exit interviews uh, when people take their child out. The, the, the childcare operators are supposed to fill in why the child was taken out, but it's, just, it's not in their interest to report bad things, right? So that may not actually be going, being surfaced to the authorities. Next slide. Um, this is a, a major problem, right? Childcare is 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Mondays to Fridays and on Saturdays there's some childcare. And there's no night childcare and uh, some childcare uh, centers will charge you if you're late in picking up your child as well. A lot of the work at the lower end tends to be shift work. 
um, one week you're, or one day you're working, you know, this hour, and then after you have to work night hours. And so then what happens during those times when the childcare is closed, right? And you do not have family support. So this is a major problem. Next slide. So um, some solutions might be that we actually have to have a more flexible type of childcare. There is a new pilot that's come out by Morningstar, and they're doing nighttime childcare. Right? We will probably need to have more of this. City uh, talked about how she and another lady they are sharing because you know her three kids are are going with the two other kids, and uh, another woman is actually taking care of the kids. So we can have a network of childminders, and Daughters of Tomorrow is actually piloting that. Now the current pilot. The, the childminders are not licensed, but if Singapore adopts this, then we can, and this has been done in the UK and in Taiwan, to actually have a network of licensed childminders, and that then offers home-based work for certain women, and they get paid a certain amount as well. So um, we see this as a possible solution. There are, there are lots of things to consider, like safety of the kids, but I think it's something that is worth exploring. Next slide. Lack of decent work, okay. So that's the care section, and now we're going to work. Now, decent work should pay sufficiently, and it actually should have enough, offer you enough rest, and if you need to take leave because you need to mind your, your family, it should offer you that. So, um, we found for this group of 47, about a third were in formal employment, meaning, and I say formal meaning that they get CPF, okay. Uh, one-third, 36% were not earning any money at all, and 28% were on home base or ad hoc casual work. Next slide. Next slide. What are the problems? The first one is the lack of employment benefits. So um, this story of, you know, how, and Sidi said, if I take leave, the employer will look at it unfavorably, and many of the women actually had suffered this. And they ended up losing their jobs because they took too much leave. The childcare, there was hand, foot and mouth disease, etc. They had to take one week off and then they were fired, right? Uh, so 57% complained about lack of paid childcare leave. Okay, we need to unpack this a little bit more, but let's go to the next slide. So what kind of jobs were these, were these people in? Did, was there built-in childcare leave okay, or not? So, now, this is where it helps to be a lawyer. Because there is this thing called formal employment, which is actually what, who is in formal employment? And it's a legal test, right? Uh, do you, is, does, the company, does the company have to pay you CPF? It's actually a legal test. The legal test is, is this a contract of service or is this a contract for service? In our paper, we talk about five different types of arrangements that people find themselves in. So think of yourself, you are having a party and you say, oh, it would be good to have uh, someone come in to actually help us to clear and wash the dishes. You engage someone for three hours and uh, you're like, oh, great, all right. So that's casual employment and that's clearly not formal employment at this point, right? It will fall under casual work. You like this person so much and you say, okay, can you come in every Saturday to, to now clean my house, right? Every Saturday you come and I'll, I'll pay you $15 an hour, right? It sort of starts to move to formal employment. You keep doing this for about three years, right? It becomes pretty, it's almost like she, she does expect that, uh, that the worker does expect that there will be work and you do expect this person to actually come in it becomes more like formal employment. So this is quite a gray thing. Now, it is so gray, right, that when you actually ask uh, MOM, like, okay, this is my arrangement. Can you tell me whether I have to pay CPF for this person? They, in all these types of cases, they can't give you a clear cut answer. They said, oh, we, sorry, we, and they give you the legal test. And I'm like, wow, I, I, I don't know how to apply this legal test to my situation. Can you just say yes or no, formal or not? And they can't, all right? This is the state of the 
the law at this point and how they, 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 they don't actually need to go through this law, but that's how they are they're doing it, right? So, so a lot of people then, right, will just fall under casual work because you don't have a clear definitive statement from MOM that you have to actually uh, pay CPF. So then no CPF, that means not covered under Employment Act. So no, no, no benefits. You can be terminated at any point without any notice. The, this thing called the progressive wage um, model, which is what Singapore has said is our answer to minimum wage, right? In the cleaning section, we, say, uh, we have now said, all right, uh, this is what the minimum should be, and then if you have more qualification, this is what it should be, et cetera. So there's a wage ladder. It doesn't apply to casual work, right? If you look at it, it just applies to employment. Uh, workfare income supplement, Singapore's answer as well to um, making work pay better, also doesn't apply well to this type of casual work. So let's go to the next slide. All right. So what we're asking for, formal employment. We did find people who said, I have CPF, but I had no benefits. I'm like, well, that's clearly, clearly, clearly a breach of the employer's duties, right? But they, they didn't know their rights. So when city says, we as workers should know our rights, it's not so easy to know your rights because we've gone through the websites, it's not so directed at employees or workers, it is directed at, at employers. So they really, I think here in terms of knowing your rights, I think we can do a much better job of saying what your rights should be. If you, should, if you have CPF, you definitely should be having all of the benefits. And so there are inspectors that do go around and, and ask companies I think, about their, how they're treating their employees. They should do this more. And there should be anti-discrimination legislation because there were, and you'll see some of the stories in the papers, in the paper that we have, there, are, there were people who said the employer didn't want to give them a job because they found out that they had many kids, one. And then those who took leave, they were sacked. Uh, and so they were, there was a discrimination on the basis of family responsibilities. Now, casual work, right? Now completely, completely unregulated. In places like Australia, New Zealand, the UK, there is some regulation, different types of rights, but appropriate, right, for this kind of labor. We, there is a framework. And in Singapore, we have nothing, right? So what kind of thing should it include? Uh, actually, these sort of hourly works should be paid at a higher hourly rate because you don't have to pay CPF. You don't have to take care of people's leave. There's so many, in Australia and New Zealand, New Zealand, actually this work is quite sought after because it pays quite well. It has a 25% loading in Australia compared to, of course you need to have a minimum wage in order to say, well, 25% more than the minimum wage is, is X, right? So there needs to be a base, and you say you, you load on top of that. We can do it in the cleaning industry, for example, where there's sort of a minimum wage and add 25% for all the ad hoc workers. Uh, there should be some sort of leave benefits and protection after six months, and a right to convert to a permanent contract after 12 months, right? These are our recommendations. Next slide. Work doesn't pay enough. Very, very big problem. Now, uh, this is, these are four families, three families, and this is uh, situations where two parents are working. So we actually took the situations which were not so dire. And we found that even with two parents working, these families with, you know, and look at the number of, of people in the household, they all fell, even with two people working, below the com care threshold for public assistance. So what does that mean? We have no poverty line. So we take as a proxy. If the gov government says we are prepared to give some support at this level, which is um, $1,900 per household, okay, if that income is what, below $1,900 per household, or for larger families, below $650 per capita income, um, then uh, that was the, the line that we took and all of these families fell below that line. Even when they're working, they, they still don't go above the, that, that threshold. Okay. So next slide. We then looked at three families, right? And th these are case studies provided by Daughters of Tomorrow, of people who transitioned from Comcare 
to uh, work. And we said, okay, are they better off working, right? Because when you work, there are increased expenses. City has to pay $14 for her cab every day because she has no choice to get to work on time. So you find the, the net position before employment, right, is the middle line where it's in pink, 176, 246, 230. And then when they get to work, they are actually worse off and in fact in deficit. So this would be the situation if Comcast stopped completely and we haven't taken into account something called workfare income supplement. So next slide, when we do take into account uh, workfare income supplement, which you can get if you are below 35 and you, are, uh, work, you have this level of income, they are still worse off because now, not as badly off, but the cash component is not that much, right? It's $27, $44, $50. So they're still worse off than if they were on Comcare and if Comcare wasn't cut off. Then we approached the ministry and they said, oh, okay, and we also did get some updates from our respondents. Now they don't cut off com Comcare when you start work, which was what used to happen because that is one of the conditions. You are below this level and you don't have a job. So now they say, okay, we will taper off, but again, on a case-by-case -case appeal basis. Every three months or six months, you come to us, you show us how much you're spending, we see whether or not you, sh you, know, you should continue to be on Comcare. All the time, right? You are just barely trying to, to make your life a little better and you have to really appeal to all of the gatekeepers uh, to support you. So work is not very attractive. So let's see the next slide, which is the position now, right? They are, you get a job and then on a case by case basis and not guaranteed, right? You might uh, get Comcare extension, right? And you're still worse off. Oh, you, you may be maybe about the same as when you weren't working. Okay, what we want. Next slide. This is what we would like to uh, see, right? And there are, of course, many different solutions, but we think, let's think out of the box and let's think, you know, what we can really do and make work really attractive and a way to get out of poverty. So instead of case by case, we want to see that if a person gets work, and this should be upfront, this is the policy, not case by case. You say that Comcare will continue at the same level for six months. And then after that, it tapers off. And at the six month point, that there should be a retention bonus. That if the person has managed to stay in this job for six months, Comcare will give them a retention bonus because we have found that that is an important milestone. When women go to work under uh, the Daughters of Tomorrow's uh, help, when they can make it to the six month mark, they're likely to be able to stay longer. So give them some incentive. And then at that point, financial literacy training right, at the six-month point, and for every dollar that they save after that, do a matching, right, so that you can see, right, as you work, how much uh, it offers you exactly and that it is financially very attractive to get to work. Because once we can break that, once we can get them to work and you are on an upward cycle, there is a fighting chance that you can get out. Next slide. Then we saw that there were limitations in the workfare, right? Firstly, it applied to only those above 35. Why? These people are, this work, this group of, of, of people who have only up to 16 year uh, ON levels, from the start, their jobs were paying very poorly. You do not need to wait till they're 35. Just start them off. Work. Wages have become so bad for everyone at that level that we need to make it more attractive. So just start workfare for people above below a certain level of income uh, when they start work, not at 35. Um, people who are uh, doing who are who, who are not employed, um, 
they actually fall out of the workfare scheme and they need to actually have a separate procedure. So currently, if I'm a home baker and I actually, you know, maybe make $200 a month from baking cakes, I could apply for workfare, but in order to do that, I have to register myself on the income tax website and, and declare my trade income. Okay, most of the people at this level, they do not pay taxes. They've never gone onto the IRA's website. In fact, when you go on the IRA's website, usually they'll say, oh, you earn below like $22,000, you don't need to file. But we're asking people to file income tax so that we can pay them WIS. And we are also saying to them, you need to pay your Medisafe, right? When we looked at how much cash we would get at $200 per month, and then looked at how much cash I have to pay for Medisafe, I was minus, okay? It just doesn't make sense for WIS, the current scheme, right? Uh, so for this, we have a different solution. We're saying, okay, you guys have, we now have PELA, there's, I think the government had to do, use this scheme because they couldn't track how much people were actually earning from their home-based work. So you set up a, an app where people can use this app to both collect money from their customers. So you tell the customer, you pay me through PELA, and for the money that I get, then they will then now top up a WIS. Because WIS works now for the employed because it is so uh, easy. Administratively, the government sees you have money coming into your CPF, they will give you WIS. There's no sign up, registration, nothing. We should make the same possible for people who are self-employed. Okay, is that? Okay, so uh, these are the five major recommendations that we have. They're a bit technical. Uh, because they are about structural difficulties that we have, and, and thank you for your patience in you know uh, walking through uh, this with me. All right, thank you.